Ladies and gentlemen, I feel honored that you are still with us here. Um, this is going to be the final um, plenary with uh, two distinguished keynotes. And I really feel honor, honored to um, actually chair this session on uh, transformative social innovation and advocacy. So let me invite um, to perform um, an assistant professor from uh, the Dutch Research Institute for Transitions, also academic director um, of the Transition Academy. So please welcome Flor Avellino. Good morning. Uh, it's an honor to be here to talk about our research on transformative social innovation uh, and new economies. Uh, I heard there was a great party last night. Just out of curiosity, how many of you were at the party? <laughs> wow, okay. Well, impressive that you're still here. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so it's my first time at this uh, conference, so I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, before I dive into the content, uh, let me just say a little bit about the research project. Uh, it's called TRANSIT, which stands for Transformative Social Innovation Theory. Uh, it's a four-year research project funded by the European Union, and we're now in our final year. We have about 12 partners and 25 researchers, which includes Balint and Georgie and Tom Bowler, who are a part of this community, um, and uh, mostly from Europe and Latin America. And I'm not going to go into the details of this project, but you can find all the background information, deliverables, working papers, etc., uh, online if you want to know more. So what I will do in the next 20 to 25 minutes is clarify what we mean by transformative social innovation. Uh, I'll say a bit more about the case study, uh, one of the case studies that we did on, eco, on the eco-village movement. Uh, then I will talk about how this eco-village movement relates to new economies and also our other case studies. And I end by saying some comments about social, how social relations and uh, institutional logics are changing. And uh, the slides uh, will be made available, so if you want them, just send me an email and I'll send it to you. Okay, there are many definitions of social innovation. We build on them and we combine them. Uh, and we define social innovation as a change in social relations invol involving new ways of doing, new ways of knowing, new ways of framing, and new ways of organizing. So if we take the example of community energy, so the, the phenomenon in the past decades that has grown exponentially where people are producing their own energy, uh, obviously th this has a very strong physical, technological, and ecological component because without solar energy panels or windmills, it would be really difficult to produce local energy. But we argue that community energy is also socially innovative in the sense that it also requires and leads to new social relations between neighbors, uh, between consumers and producers, between citizens and local governments. And these new kind of relations also come with new practices. Like on the picture you see people going to their roofs to attend to their solar panels together with their neighbors, which is a new practice. It also requires new kind of knowledge on how to do all this. It also comes with new framing, so even entirely new words, like the prosumer, which is a combination of the producer and the consumer in one person. And last but not least, it of course also requires different ways of organizing and different ways of decision making, such as the reinvention of the cooperative in the case of community energy. And here I very consciously use the word reinvention uh, because, as we all know, there's nothing new about the cooperative. It has existed for many centuries. But what we see is that in the past um, years, there has been a, a reappreciation and a reinvention of the cooperative, especially in reaction to the economic crisis. Uh, so it's important to realize that social innovation is not necessarily about entirely new things. It can also be very much about reinventing old things in combination with uh, new things. So in the project, we are particularly interested in what makes social innovation transformative. And we 
conceptualize this in relation to the social context and the dominant institutions therein. And we argue that social innovation is transformative to the extent that it challenges, alters, and or replaces the dominant institutions in that social context. And here with dominant institutions, I don't just mean governments or big companies. I really mean dominant institutions in the broadest sense. So we're talking about the dominant ways of doing, organizing, and thinking in society. Uh, and what we are particularly interested in is to understand how actors who are involved in initiatives and networks, uh, what is their agency and how are they empowered or disempowered to contribute to such transformative social innovation? And to con conceptualize these kind of dynamics, we build on all sorts of social, political, and interdisciplinary theories. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but we have several working papers and deliverables on our conceptual framework and theoretical uh, uh, deliberations, if you're interested. Now, all this conceptual and theoretical work is grounded and tested in uh, a lot of empirical work as well. Uh, we study a total of 20 social movements that you see here on the screen. And they are very different, very diverse, but they also have something in common. First of all, obviously, uh, they work on social innovation according to our definition. Some of them also call it that themselves, others don't call it that themselves. Uh, and they all have transformative ambitions to a certain extent. And another thing that they have in common is that they are very translocal, meaning that these movements have international network organizations that operate at a global scale, but they're also very locally rooted in local initiatives. So we have studied these 20 transnational networks at the level of these international uh, organizations, but also zooming in on about 100 local, regional or national initiatives in about 27 countries, mostly in Europe and Latin America and a few others. So I'm not going to go into the whole methodological approach. Again, we have lots of deliverables on that. Uh, what I want to do instead, rather than trying to cover 20 social movements in 20 minutes, uh, I would like to say a bit more about one of the case studies that we have done uh, on the Ecovillage movement, where we have mostly focused on uh, the Global Ecovillage Network, the European subdivision of that, and we have looked at five European ecovillages. So, what you see here is a picture of the Dutch Ecovillage Festival a few years ago. And when I show this picture to my friends or colleagues, a lot of people see a bunch of hippies around a campfire singing Kumbaya. And besides the fact that there's nothing wrong with that to start with, but besides that, I hope to show you that ecovillages are so much more than that. So what is an ecovillage? According to the definition of the Global Ecovillage Network, an ecovillage is an intentional, traditional or urban community that is consciously designed through locally owned participatory processes in all four dimensions of sustainability, where they include culture as a separate one, to regenerate their social and natural environments. Uh, an intentional community is a sociological term to, to refer to a group of people who have chosen to live together with commitment and a common purpose. And what is important to understand is that ecovillages are different from your average dropout commune kind of thing, because most of them really see themselves as seeds of social critique and social movement. So often they're founded really uh, based on a critical attitude towards society with an explicit wish to change the ways of living and they really often also strive for an intervention in society rather than subordinating to the existing system. So there is often an activist agenda behind it. So there are thousands, the estimation is that there are thousands of these eco-village kind of initiatives and this is not just about people living in eco-villages, it's also the many, many people that visit them and learn from them to also then translate this into other contexts such as urban farming initiatives and so on. And uh, about 500 of these eco-village projects are organized in the global eco-village network which has several subdivisions on the different continents and these, this network or these networks organize all sorts of national, regional, and global meetings where eco-villages come together and share their experiences. What eco-villages are mostly known for is that they have been pioneers in organic agriculture, back in the day when everybody still thought that was crazy, uh, ecological construction of houses, and low-tech innovation. So what you see here are pictures from Tamera Eco-Village in Portugal, 
and what you see there on the left bottom is a solar cooker where they experiment with catching sun to, uh, to, to boil, to cook food. Uh, what Tamira is known most for, besides of some other controversies, uh, what, one of the things it's most known for is um, working with so-called their, their water retention landscape. So working with permaculture design principles to create lakes. So they have created lakes um, um, uh, through all sorts of uh, alternative, innovative methods. And by doing so, they have transformed a very dry area in the, in the south of Portugal into this kind of green, lush uh, oasis. And what you see is that people from all over the world, experts, researchers, are visiting Tamira to learn from them to see whether or not this is something that could be replicable in other places as a climate change adaptation strategy. So you see that's a very local experiment and inspires uh, more um, uh, global research. Now, Besides these technological and ecological things, uh, Tamira really emphasizes that most of their work is actually on really working on social relations between people and also between people and nature, where they also give a lot of attention to spiritual aspects. So just to give you a few other examples to avoid that Tamira becomes your image of eco-villages, there is obviously hundreds and hundreds of other eco-villages, just a few pictures. This is a uh, Scot uh, Findhorn, one of the oldest eco-villages in Scotland, where they have transformed whiskey barrels into houses. Uh, this is e e eco-village Bergen in the Netherlands, where they work with this decision-making method called sociocracy, which is basically an alternative for formal democracy and also an alternative for consensus-making. It's something in between, to put it very crudely. Uh, this is Niederkaufungen, a community in Germany, which I wanted to mention because, interestingly, they are not part of the Global Eco-Village Network. Um, they are 70 people living together with one bank account. They started in the 80s and it was kind of an anarchistic reaction to their own way of doing communism. Uh, and one of the reasons they're not part of the Eco-Village Network, according to a woman that I, I spoke to there, is that they are uncomfortable with the very strong spiritual connotations that a lot of eco-villages have. And Earth Haven in the USA, I have to admit, I don't know anything about the case, but I found this picture online and I thought it was a very nice example of a very low-tech version of an electric car. So it kind of symbolizes this idea of low-tech innovation. Uh, so these kind of innovations and experiments are being shared on the, on the website of the network, for instance, through the solution library, where they really try to combine all these different solutions and... and, and, and uh, experiments, uh, but they also explicitly try to share these things beyond the eco-villages. It's not only the sharing amongst the eco-villages, but also with others. So, for instance, the Ecolisa Network, which was uh, the, e the global eco-village network, is one of their founding members, where they cooperate with lots of other movements, such as permaculture, transition towns, uh, with the aim of really making the link with European policymakers. Very interesting network, Ecolisa. Uh, they also work on capacity building projects such as Circle, where they try to learn from eco-villages and other initiatives on how to create resilient communities. And they do a lot with education. Gaia Education is an organization especially dedicated to organizing eco-village design education, where they, for instance, also cooperate with the United Nations to organize core executive courses on sustainability leadership. Uh, now, of course, uh, all this is a very positive uh, story about eco-villages. Obviously, there is a lot of mud underlying it, both literally and figuratively speaking. So not just only the physical mess uh, and difficulties, but also a lot of social tensions and conflicts and challenges. Uh, so I think a lot of eco-village people would agree with me to say that, to emphasize that these are not utopias, but they're rather what... Foucault has called heterotopia, so there are spaces of otherness where people experiment with different ways of life, where it can go wrong, but these experiments can also inspire, if they work, they can inspire also other ways in mainstream society. So this was just one example out of many different examples that we study in the transit project. And what I would like to do now is to kind of zoom out and go a little bit in how these different networks look at new economies. Uh, because one of the things you see is that actually all of them are very critical of the current economic system and all of them emphasize that we need a different economy. And when we compare the different uh, uh, movements to each other, we find that there are four different 
narratives on new economy that we can distinguish. First of all, this idea of green economy through degrowth and localization. Second of all, an idea of social entrepreneurship and social economy. Third of all, the collaborative economy, which includes sharing economy. And last but not least, the solidarity economy. So if you look at these four from a kind of mainstream classical economic perspective, they're all kind of similar, marginal, weirdish, alternative economy things. But when you zoom in on them, they're actually quite different and they have also quite different specific ideas on how change should come and can come about. So we have recently published an article about how these new economies manifest in the urban context using our, some of our case studies. And we also have several working papers where we're elaborating this concept of narrative of change and new economy. And we are rewriting it and submitting it. So if you're interested, I can share the latest version with you. Uh, to say a little bit about these meta-narratives, they are, of course, ideal type distinctions. Uh, so um, if you look at the eco-village movement, but also, for instance, the transition towns movement, you see that they are very inspired by this idea of degrowth and relocalization. And if you then look at the theory of change that comes with that, it's very focused on self-provision, on really lifestyle change, so as to reduce consumption and production, and also very much this idea of living in local communities to kind of close the loops at a more local scale. A rather different cluster, which you see in networks such as Impact Hub or Ashoka, is focused much more on social entrepreneurship and social economy, where it's the focus is on uh, enabling not-for-profit organizations and social entrepreneurs. So basically enterprises that do make profit, but profit is not the main goal. So it's just, uh, it's, it's making profit, being entrepreneurial, but in a socially conscious way. Then there's a third cluster, which is more focused on collaborative and sharing economy, where you really see that it's a different focus on sharing goods, but also redesigning goods. Uh, through decentralized networks enabled by new technologies and phenomena such as 3D printing. So it's not only about sharing them on the consumption side, but also producing them in a different way. Uh, for instance, by the, through the use of digital fabrication workshops that are open and accessible to citizens, such as fab labs or hacker spaces. And then last but not least, we have a whole cluster that, uh, that focuses more on the solidarity economy, where um, where there is much more emphasis on participatory democracy and also really changing our current democratic system. So it, uh, th this narrative is much more about institutional, uh, political institutional change. Now, as, as I said, there are quite some differences across these narratives and you also see quite some critical debates across these narratives. So, uh, stereotypically, someone from the solidarity economy can be quite critical of social entrepreneurship because they would argue that the idea of social entrepreneurship still reproduces the idea of the enterprise society and profit making. And they say that doesn't change things, but it actually reproduces them. And the other way around, social entrepreneurs can be quite critical of all the others saying that as long as it's not entrepreneurial and financially sustainable, it's not going to change anything. So there's quite some debate across, across that. Having said that, despite of these differences, there are also a lot of commonalities, uh, synergies, complementarities, and uh, overlaps. And one of the most important uh, similarities is the focus that all of them emphasize that in order to have a new economy or any kind of social change, uh, this really needs to be based in the renewal of social relations. So a lot of our cases spend a lot of time and energy on community building and on reinventing and reappreciating and elaborating uh, relational values and principles such as trust, connectedness, reciprocity, inclusivity, and so on. And here, for many of them, it's not just about changing interpersonal relations between individuals, but it's also about changing societal relations at a more institutional level. Because we really see that social innovation, uh, a lot of people think that social innovation is by definition something that comes from civil society. But in our case studies, we see that it emerges across all these different sectors, whether it's the state, the market, uh, community, third sector. It, it emerges in all these different sectors. And more importantly, it changes the relations between these sectors and institutions. 
and it also challenges the institutional logics underlying those different sectors by, by negotiating and renegotiating new adapted institutional logics. So to come back to the example of eco-villages, uh, obviously the way in which eco-villages work on ecological, uh, build ecological houses in a cooperative way, which requires a different kind of grassroots land use planning, ecological construction, community ownership, it very starkly contrasts with the dominant centralized spatial planning system, the construction regulations, uh, the commercial housing market. So each and every eco-village that we have studied has very overt confrontations with the local government uh, and with local project developers um, regarding these issues. And the successful eco-villages, and that's a big if because most of them fail exactly for this reason, but the successful eco-villages don't just challenge these things for themselves. Through this confrontation, by definition, when an eco-village succeeds, it means that the local government has been um, ready to adapt something or to give space to something. So local regulations very slowly uh, also get adapted in reaction to these kind of experiments. And this then doesn't only enable the eco-village, but it also enables other interesting projects around the surroundings, such as an urban farming initiative that suddenly becomes possible because something has been adapted. So here you really see how, although it's very slow, very long-term, institutions get adapted in reaction to these experiments. So as our colleagues would argue, the institutionalization of social innovation always finds itself between transformation and capture meaning that this moment when social innovation is confronted with dominant institutions, on the one hand, it's a very interesting moment because this is the moment that they can have transformative impact, that they can actually make a difference. But it's also the moment that they can get suppressed and stifled or even captured. So uh, to give you the example of solar energy and organic products, which now are very normal everywhere around us and in, 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 um, in the supermarket, if you look at the origins, the more radical origins of these uh, innovations, some people would call this a story of success because something that was very radical, kind of marginal, inaccessible, has penetrated the market, replaced other products, and become more accessible to more people. Other, would, other people would call it a tragedy because something that was very innovative and authentic has been captured by capitalist neoliberal interests. Uh, and so on. So this is a, a debate that is going on now also in the sharing economy where uh, the idea of couch surfing where you could you know, travel around the world sleeping on people's couches has been translated into a very successful business model that is currently being commercially exploited uh, by the company Airbnb. And some people would say you know, this is the informal economy becoming bigger and disrupting uh, the market, and other people say, no, it's the opposite. It's the market becoming so big that it even enters your bedroom. Uh, so there's increasing concerns about that after whitewashing and greenwashing, we now also have wee-washing, where sharing and community has also become commodified. So these are some of the ongoing debates. And in conclusion, in our project, we argue that social innovations have a dialectic relation with established institutions and structures. So on the one hand, they transform them or they try to, but they at the same time also reproduce them. Uh, and because these initiatives often they lack a logical institutional home, they don't fit, which is a, a disadvantage and a barrier and really difficult. But at the same time, it's also an opportunity because they are almost forced to creatively come with hybrid organizational forms. Uh, that really have transformative potential. But all this does mean that in order to be transformative, social innovation has to really inherently involve political struggle and uh, negotiation. And this requires these initiatives to have a portfolio of quite sophisticated, different, often paradoxical strategies towards institutions. And they also need to continuously adapt and update this portfolio and their narratives of change while at the same time holding on to their original core intentions because otherwise they lose their integrity and the motivation of their members. So it's a continuously paradoxical balancing act. Um, so it's, I think the main challenge for these initiatives but also for us as researchers is to embrace these paradoxes of institutionalization, mainstreaming and capture of innovation because in innovation studies and also in social movement theories and amongst the public debates of these initiatives, 
you see that capture is seen as something bad, something that is to be avoided. But in reality, you see that you know, it happens anyway, so it's, it's also necessary to have a strategy towards it, how to deal with it and how to uh, channel it. So with these words, I would like to end with my favorite quote that I think is very applicable also to the research that you guys do and the world that we live in today. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet to be determined to make them otherwise. Thank you for your attention. Balint asked me to just mention that we have our final conference coming up. Uh, it's almost full, unfortunately, but uh, if you're interested, just write me an email and I will see if I, what I can do. And there is, of course, our website with all our reports. Thank you. Thank you very much for this floor. And um, as a second presenter, um, now I would like to invite a researcher from Aarhus University. Uh, Department of Biosciences and the section of Wildlife Ecology. Please welcome Hans-Peter Hansen. Thank you so much, Balint, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I also would like to salute the local organizing committee with a very well organized conference. I'm, uh, it's so beautiful. I was, about to, uh, I was about to start with a quote from Monty Python saying, uh, and now to something completely different. Uh, but then I was thinking, no, maybe it's not that different anyway. Um, but we will see. Um, you know this guy? Um, grab them by the pussy president. Donald Trump, who I saw yesterday, he doesn't want poor people in his, in his administration, right? Yeah. Um, I think that the day, the 8th of November 2016, somehow constitute at the climax of a global wave of political populism and, and the entrance into so-called post-truth truth politics, or post-factual politics. Um, I say so far because we don't know whether this is the peak. It might continue. Uh, sometimes I'm wondering whether we are, will we reach a point of no return uh, at some stage? I don't know. Uh, we will see. But we have seen for, for the last couple of decades these uh, uh, political, populist, often nationalist movements increase uh, all over the globe, in, in Europe, uh, in America, Asia, and so on and so forth. Uh, and definitely also in East Europe, right? And uh, something that uh, I have been reflecting about is, you know, that it really reveals the vulnerability of what we have perhaps taken for granted as some fundamental principles, at least here in the western part of the world. Some of the core values from what we sometimes refer to as modernity, right? Reasoning, science, human rights, and so on and so forth. So how do we make sense of this new historical situation? I think that's, that's one question that I am struggling with. And uh, how do we meet these societal threats? Because I really believe they are threats. 
from this new Trumpist era. era. Um, and I just want to share some of my own reflections. Uh, you probably have, have some different uh, views on this, but this, is, this represents my, my reflections on, on this thing. Making sense of the situation, I think that, that uh, on, the, on the structural level, we have some pretty good uh, uh, arguments to make sense of this. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the, the, uh, 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 the work from Piquete, you know, where he really focus on this, this uh, increased global inequality. Uh, uh, inequality. Uh, and I, I also think that, going back to Polanyi, that we have a lot to learn from him in terms of this, this concept of this embeddedness of you know, economies from people's livelihood. Uh, and I really think these are some of the key factors. Uh, but I also think there are other factors, uh, perhaps on a, on a slightly lower level. And, and I just want to point out three here. And the one is the relationship between science and society, which I will uh, elaborate a little bit upon. The other is the lack of alternative futures. The lack of alternative futures. And I, I will get back to that as well. And the erosion of the commons. Um, I just want to, I mean, you probably, most of you are aware of, of, of this picture, right, where it's, it's from. Uh, it was from a big research project. Uh, the research project was called the Manhattan Project, right? Uh, a scientific project. Um, that led to the nuclear bomb. Science and society, well, I think we, for a long period of time, we have, we have experienced the, uh, the frustrations in, sci in, in society with science, right? Uh, science no longer produces the answers as many perhaps expect, uh, or the answers to what people, you know, experience as, as their problems. And this is a long, this is not new, this is a long, this is a long going, ongoing uh, process. Uh, I still re remember my late father who, he had, he went to school for, primary school for seven years. Uh, and, and he was always complaining about science, you know. They say something yesterday, they say something different today, and tomorrow they will say something totally different again, right? He was very frustrated with, with science. I think we have all experienced these, this critique. And also the, the answers and the, the knowledge change in time and space. We know that as researchers, as scientists, but uh, for people outside academia, it, it, it might be you know, experienced as problematic. And then there's this thing about uh, power and impact. This, what I call, increased and seduci seducing use of the concept of political impact. Uh, there's this demand of, you know, impact. The research should have impact. When we apply for money, there is this uh, requirement of political impact. It, it has to be relevant. It has to do some kind of impact. Uh, and I think that we as researchers sometimes are seduced by, by, by this political impact. Um, sometimes we are perhaps a little bit opportunistic. One thing is that we might be forced, you know, to get into that that kind of thinking, that kind of, 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 uh, of, of strategy. Uh, but I also think that, that we have this, this uh, 
um, we, are, we are flattered by the power, right? We are flattered by the power holders. We are flattered when, when civil servants, governmental institutions, uh, organizations, they come to us and ask for our advice, right? I still remember the very first time I was asked by a, it was a mayor in a municipality he came and he asked for my advice. I was very proud, you know. Now I have an impact, right? I didn't have any impact, I can say. Uh, and it also leads to the question, who are the real power holders? And thinking back on what have happened the last, you know, few years and the culmination with, with Donald Trump, I think we should perhaps reconsider who are the power holders. Is it the stakeholders or is it perhaps the citizens, the population? I don't know. But I think that if we are too obsessed with the stakeholders, we might also lure ourselves. Um, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that, that, this, that stakeholders, the interest group, they represent predefined interests, which are often, almost always, but, but definitely often separated from the broader societal responsibility. So there's a huge difference here whether you are a citizen or you are a stakeholder, right? And it keeps the actor locked in boxes. Um, and I have written, together with colleagues, a couple of papers uh, where we have tried to analyze the, this, the concept of stakeholders and how it plays out and how it actually keeps the actors, sometimes against their own will, locked in these boxes, these predetermined boxes. The lack of alternative futures. Well, I think most of you are familiar with the work of Ulrich Beck and especially his concept of the risk society, right? Uh, which, which is also reminding us that, you know, from an everyday life perspective, science and globalization also constitute a source of, of uncertainties of anxiety, of fear. Uh, I mean, when is the last time that we have heard a politician talk, talking about a vision, right? A vision for the future. It's hard for me to recall, you know, any recent visions developed by politicians. The future has be become something that we have to avoid. So we are all the time trying to, you know, while we're moving into the future, we're trying to avoid a lot of risks, environmental, economically, you know, terror, terror which is uh, one of the, the, the new global risks. And then we have this thing about, you know, that large, large groups of society do doesn't feel that they are recognized in this strategic political game going on. I took a quote from Wolfgang Sachs. It's actually from two 2000 where he was, he said, sustainable development no longer represents a hope for the future and therefore it is meaningless. I think it was a good, at least for, for reflection, for my own reflection, it was a good, good statement. The erosion of the commons. Well, I think this is really one of the core issues that we are dealing with today. The erosion of the commons. The commons are crucial for any society. If there aren't any commons, society doesn't make any sense, right? 
uh, and I here have have a reference to uh, Ugo Mattei. I think some of you know him, Italian law professor, who argue that that this is one of the big biggest threats to democracy that the commons are being eroded. His argument is that private property is heavily protected in, in our constitutions, but the commons are not. So we see a lot of privatization of the commons and erosion of the commons going on. Uh, and then we have this call for commoning, the, the creation or recreation of the commons. I think it was, uh, it was actually Peter Lien, uh, Leinbau who was, who was introducing the, this notion of commoning. Uh, we have to reclaim, we have to make or remake the commons. So that leads me to two questions, uh, two, two fundamental questions. How can we renew our societies politically, economically, and ecologically without throwing the baby out with the bath water. Meaning without throwing, you know, all the, the good things, all the, the benefits from modernity away. And secondly, and that's more on an operational level, how can we as researchers support the democratic development of value-based visions for the future, alternative futures, and their implementation in a way which is empowering, legitimate, and responsible. I think this is, this is at least to me, the big, big challenge for me as a researcher. Uh, I work myself with action research uh, with a particular kind of action research which we call utopian, uh, critical utopian action research. It's been developed through the last 15 years or so. Uh, but here we are trying to address these three main issues I mentioned. Uh, in a way where we are working with the concept of community agoras. We are trying to develop some spaces for deliberation or deliberative citizens dialogues. And citizens here is important. We don't work with stakeholders, we work with citizens. So everyone who participate in these workshops, they participate as citizens. And it makes a hell of a difference whether someone is, is, is uh, uh, is involved as a stakeholder, like a farmer or as a citizen. The responses are totally different. We work with, with commons. Commons is a concept which is important here. Uh, I used to say that we work with the material commons, but also the immaterial commons. The material commons is, is the resources, right? We all breathe the same air. I think most people will agree that here we have something in common. The, the air is a commons, right? We all depend on the same hydrological system and so on and so forth. Um, and then we have the immaterial commons. And here, again, I, th I, I think that we can all agree that there is at least one immaterial commons we can agree upon, and that's the future. We all have the future in commons, whether we like it or not, or whether we like each other or not, right? So that's the point of departure. And then we work from an everyday life perspective, meaning we work with the experiences, the values, and the knowledge of the participants. We're not trying to enforce, you know, from the beginning our understanding of the world. We depart from the everyday life perspective. And then we work with this, these different stages 
we work with critique, we work with developing the you know, visions of utopia, joint fact findings, and implementation. So we have some different contexts we have worked within, national parks, water management, wetland restoration, rural development, working life, welfare studies, and wildlife management. And if I had the time, I would, I would talk a little bit more about uh, this wildlife management context that is a new context for us, that which we are trying to, to, uh, to work with. But I actually, I think that some of you might have read the, the, the case description that was distributed. So you can read about the case, how we work with, with this approach within this concept of, in particular, wolf management in Scandinavia, which is very, uh, very um, sensitive and there's a lot of, uh, it's very heavily politicized, there's a lot of also violence and, and threats and political radicalization with, within that single question. Uh, I, just, I, I just want to say that this is it's here on, the, on this um, uh, post on the back of the car. It says, rather five years in jail than a wolf on my field. It kind of illustrates you know, the, the level of tensions here. And this is a tattoo on a, on a female's, young female's uh, leg saying, there, the, there are three double, double Vs, and it says, dare to resist wolf. Um, so it's very emotional. But you can read not much about the wolf and wildlife things, but other, other contexts, the other contexts I mentioned in this book that came out last year uh, with several examples from, from around, from Scandinavia and from Nicaragua and Africa, uh, where we work with these. With, uh, with this approach. So, thank you. Thank you so much for this. And we have some very little time left for, for a chill out session. So let's go and find our place. And I would like to crowdsource some questions from, from the audience. Uh, we have two mics here, or maybe here. So, please raise your hands, introduce yourselves, and go with a question. Hello. This is very, very good. Uh, my name is David Barkin. I'm from Mexico. Um, my question to both of you is the kinds of things you're talking about, uh, how would you, each one of you, think about them differently in the context of the global south as opposed to the ex most of the examples that, you, well, all the examples you were giving and most of the examples you were giving which were from the north, where you have a U EU project, that's understandable. Okay, so short answers, short questions. Uh, well, the first thing I want to say about that is that it's, it's a huge challenge for future research to do more research on, on the Global South from this perspective. But in the transit project, we originally started with the dream of studying the whole world. And then we came to the conclusion that maybe that was not very realistic. So we decided to focus on Europe and Latin America. So we have some insights on the Global South from that perspective. And one of the things that is particularly interesting in social innovation is that there are actually examples such as participatory budgeting, one of our cases that did not start in, you know, that actually emerged in the Global South, in Brazil, especially because of the lack of certain welfare state and institutions. So you really see that institution, that social innovation emergence in answer to problematic uh, institutions and the decrease of the wel welfare state in the European context, but that in the Global South, it also emerges in another context. So, yeah. Well, I, I, um, <coughs> 
I think it's a very good question. And um, uh, I, would, I, prob I, would, I will answer it in a different way. I have, uh, I have always been hesitant myself to you know, enter global south context. Um, because uh, I I feel comfortable within you know my my own part of the world, uh, and I don't want to go and you know tell other people what they should do. I think we have plenty of examples where we have done that with le with very little success, right? Uh, but I have got the invitation many times, uh, also from one of the professors I worked with, and and. Uh, at some point, he cornered me with, with a question. He said, well, do you think that there, are double, that there should be double standards, right? Shouldn't people you know, in the Global South have the same access to you know, uh, fair and just political institu institutions and democracy and so on as, as, as we in, 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 you know, in the privileged Scandinavia, right? So actually, I, I went with him uh, to Nicaragua and, and uh, worked a little bit there. And, uh, and then I realized, well, we have, uh, we have so much in common. And, and we, were, we were using the same, type, the same approach as we have been using in the Scandinavian context. And I realized it worked equally as well there. So I don't know if it's an answer, but it's just you know my own experience that I, I share with you. Okay, there are two more hands, Esther and. He's uh, not paying attention. So, so I think I want to challenge the second speaker maybe a little bit further on this topic because um, on one hand you were saying well we this there's this Trumpism or populism. Uh, which, which could be interpreted as a move away from globalization. And then in a certain moment, you, you, made a, you made an interesting claim that made me think. We all have the future in common. But in a very real sense, this is simply not true. We don't, right? So I was wondering how you make sense of these two claims together, both populism, which is a retreat, from globalization, and there's actually some good reasons for that. And at the same time, this, this pre actually very Western view that is also in the UN articulated quite often, that we all share the common future, where logically countries from the global south say, no, we don't. We don't. We don't share a common future that is very, very... Um, that's reasoning from a privileged perspective. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I would like to take the other question as well. Uh, you raise your hand. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for your talks. Um, my name is Insa Tesfeld from Germany. I have a short question because you talked about unsuccessful eco-villages. So I would be interested, how do you actually define success of a social innovation as that's quite, I mean, for me, that's quite difficult to tackle and even more difficult to measure. Okay, and we take up a third question. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk. So, Klaus Bash. Um, Flor, one of the things that concerns me about social innovation is the need to make everything seem as if it's innovation when it's not. I think you touched on it slightly. Organic agriculture, for example, as you were describing, that is traditional agriculture. It's the normal form of agriculture. If you go to Austria, where I live, organic food is prevalent all over the place. It's not an innovation and it hasn't come from eco-villages. It's embedded in the system and it's always been there. It was never removed and it was defended. So it's very different. So I think you can get examples like that. Uh, one of the things with the eco-villages, I don't want to denigrate them, I think they're great and I think it's really important we study them, but also I'm quite concerned they don't get some very fundamental things right, basic things. Fintorn did a, a study of its own uh, social metabolism and it discovered that it wiped out its entire record because the average Fintorn 
a member travels the same amount of flying as the average European citizen, which destroys their entire carbon budget and their pollution and so on. And flying is the single most harmful act you can undertake. So if you don't get the basics right, then what's the point of living in an eco-village and doing all the other stuff, right? Uh, and then, Hans, in terms of the Trump era, suppose, the Trump era, as if this was a new era, if Clinton had been elected, everybody would have assumed that things were going to go wonderfully and Paris was going to be fulfilled. Paris is rubbish. Paris has nothing in it. The United States under Obama signs the Paris Agreement while becoming the number one oil exporter in the world. He built more oil and gas uh, developments than any other previous administration. 75% increase in offshore oil and gas. Pipelines all over the country, fighting indigenous people, land grabbing God knows what. And yet he was a nice guy. Okay. Um, in order not to talk to, for too long, I'll focus on three very specific questions to me. Uh, so to, to start with success, we actually, I don't know if it's cowardice, we stay away from that question of measuring success. Uh, and we kind of stay very close to what initiatives themselves uh, would consider success. So we are in, interested in the transformative impact or whatever other word you want to use. So the, in our case, that has something to do with success. But in terms of more from the perspective of the initiatives, uh, I think surviving as an eco-village is kind of a very important one. So um, uh, some of the research on eco-villages claims that 95, 95% of eco-village projects fail in the first five years in the sense that they just stop existing. Uh, and this often has to do a lot with land use planning permissions. So that's what I meant with unsuccessful eco-villages, simply in the sense that they stop existing because they just don't manage to, to exist. So it's a very basic <laughs> idea of success. Um, then uh, there was a question about uh, the, the, the eco-villages and the, the flying paradox, and there was another question that you asked. Yes, of course, innovation, very important one. Uh, so, of course, uh, also in the, my f the field that I work in, uh, th there is uh, transition studies, social technical innovation. There is also pr already a problem with the concept of social innovation. And then in a lot of social sciences, there is a problem with the concept of innovation in itself. And I often had my doubts about this concept as well, to be honest, because it's more about social change. Why do we need to call it innovation? But the more I read, the more I think there is something in the idea of social innovation that is useful useful. First of all, when you compare it to some of the social movement theory, it's this shift away, and yesterday there was also an interesting talk about that, from movements as resistance and being against something towards creating an alternative. So the idea of social innovation really focuses on the creation of an alternative. And as I also emphasize, it's not necessarily about entirely new, but it's also not about going so organic agriculture. I would disagree with you that there's nothing innovative about it, because of course there, there's something very old about it, but it's about recombining it with new technologies. And this is also what I always emphasize in eco-villages. People have this image, oh, these are the people that want to live with horses and go back to Middle Ages. No, the eco-village movement is very specifically about using some of the best of technology to combine it with appreciating old traditions. So that's what I think is the added value of the innovation concept, that you look for these kind of creative new con combinations. Um, Eco-villages, yes, of course, there's a lot of uh, paradoxes and uh, hypocrisies maybe even, and I can imagine, it, I'm not surprised that Fintorn has, a, has this flying thing because Fintorn is actually very active in a lot of international uh, networks. So they have a lot of high uh, yeah, functioning professionals who uh, are uh, involved in a lot of international networks. So first of all, I would say, is it worse when people living in an eco-village is flying around the world compared to ecological economics researchers flying around the world? That's my first question. Second of all, besides the flying, they do other things differently in their, in their village that is already uh, more sustainable or they try to compared to other um, 
uh, neighborhoods. And second of all, there's a lot of diversity of eco-villages. So I'm sure that Findhorn might be, uh, it might be the case in Findhorn, but other eco-villages have actually, has been proven that they have a much lower footprint. So some of the people in the eco-villages that I met have a rule that they only are allowed to fly once every two, three years, and they really pick very carefully where they go. So there's a lot of diversity about uh, that, but there is, of course, also this uh, hypocrisy. Yes. Well, I, uh, to your questions about uh, the common future, I'm not sure whether I really understood your question. I mean, I... I I believe that whatever happens in the global south will have an impact on, on the global north and the other way around, whether we like it or not. So from that perspective, I do think we have the future in common, and we have to start to realize it, I think. And, uh, and, and to Clive, I just want to say, well, basically, I, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, but... Do you believe that it will create more that Trump will create more equality than than Clinton would have done? I mean, I think there are some proportions here that we have to I mean, we can criticize, you know, uh, I think all every American president uh, for very good reasons. But I think this is really, you know, a, a low low point, you know, in history. It's a setback for any, I think, uh, hope for progress. So we are running five minutes late, um, but we have, I think, we can pick up one short question and Ariud is there. Uh, thank you, Ariud Watman from Norway. I, I have a short question from Floor. Concerning the the case of the eco villages, and you, I mean, you emphasized the the role that local politicians could play, and the problem with the planning system. But what about the other local communities in which these eco villages are placed? How, I mean, is it possible to think about this as a local spread, or is it the other way around that they really turn their back to it? Yeah. So this is. Uh, shall I answer? Uh, so this is a very contentious issue in eco-villages, one of the most problematic, because their, their desire of a lot of eco-villages is to be this bioregional thing where they are integrated and cooperating with the region. But in reality, like in the case of Tamira, it's basically, to say it a bit crudely, 200 Germans who have landed in the middle of the Portuguese rural landscape, which comes with a, a lot of problems and challenges, particularly due to certain very different values of life. And being originally Portuguese, I sometimes felt very uncomfortable seeing that dynamic. But at the same time, I also spoke to a lot of Portuguese people asking what they thought, and they said, it's double. On the one hand, it's a bit inappropriate, you know, to, to be in, in that context. And also, for instance, they, ref they don't want to send their kids to the local school, which is uh, mandatory by Portuguese law because they want to have their own kind of Steiner kind of school, which of course is also understandable. So, some port so the, uh, the Portuguese people I spoke to said it's double. On the one hand, there is this uncomfortable dynamic, but at the same time, you do see that in the region there has been, for instance, more vegetarian restaurants. There has been bakers that now have a business model of creating organic bread because there's all these Germans. So, on the one hand, there is very problematic. <laughs> Uh, there's this problematic dynamic also of the houses, like the prices of the houses increasing like crazy dynamics as a result of this, but at the same time, it also has some beneficial dynamics. So yeah, it's really again double, but I would say a lot of eco-villages in their ideal world will want to cooperate, but it does mean that they really need to let go of their own image of the world and accept the, you know, the traditional communities around have a different worldview, obviously. So. Sometimes I think that this can be improved a little across some of the eco-villages. <laughs> but they try to. There is a lot of discussion and awareness about it. Thank you very much. Um, we started five minutes late. We ended ten minutes uh, later. Uh, there are a few other questions in the application, but they were all um, taken up by me. So if you want uh, to discuss further, then let's do it during the coffee break. Um, Thank you very much for being here.